Hi, I'm Joe. I'm an alcoholic. All of us here at White Chip hope that you've been enjoying our audiobooks and AA speakers. You are welcome to join our Facebook group. Just click the link in the description and say hello. If you support the Alcoholic Anonymous cause, please hit the like and subscribe button. We upload new AA content every day, so if you want to see more, hit the notifications button. This way, you'll be the first to know we've uploaded a new video. Without further ado, let's listen to the next AA speaker. Hi everybody, my name is Earl, I'm an alcoholic. Hi everybody, it's an uh, honor and a privilege to be here. <laughs> Dude with the bird on his shoulder. <laughs> anyway, I uh, want to thank the committee for asking me to share here. Uh, um, like I said, it's an honor to do so. I want to thank my friends for picking me up at the airport in uh, Oakland and driving me down here. Good to see all you guys again. Uh, I spoke up in, uh, where the hell was that? Where? Danville, a little while ago, and we got to meet then, and here we are again, huh? Thanks, and uh, can I sponsor C-Dubs? Good to see you, man. Great. Friends, it's great. Yeah, safe place. So, and I have on a coat and tie. Uh, I said that for my sponsor. I, uh, I didn't start drinking when I was 12. I waited as long as I possibly could. I, I had been restless, irritable, and discontented for some time prior to that. Um, I had a t I, my parents had I had a tendency to engage in bizarre behavior, and my parents would test me, get me tested. It took me to I was uh, sleepwalking and talking in my sleep when I was four. I'd, I'd get up in the middle of the night and turn on the lights as I'd go through the house and stand at the foot of my parents' bed and talk for a while, scare the hell out of my parents, and walk back through the house, turn the lights off, I was going to get back in bed, right to the psychiatrist. <laughs> the answer they had was every night before I'd go to sleep, they'd give me a tablespoon of this liquid, and I would take, drink this stuff, and it would knock me out. No more sleepwalking, no more problem. And I think uh, uh, subconsciously I, I got the information very early in my life that if you don't like the way things are going, take something. And it'll uh, it'll take care of the symptoms, and I kind of filed that away for future reference, and went into what I call the the black hole in my childhood. I don't remember a whole hell of a lot, and I've stayed sober long enough to know that I don't go looking under rocks anymore. If something comes up, I deal with it. If it doesn't, I leave it alone. I uh, um, on to age 12, 12 years old. I uh, they did a uh, took me they did an IQ test. I mean, it turned out I had a very high IQ. I don't have it anymore, so I'm not bragging. <laughs> It's gone. I, uh, so they, they, my father decided it was time for me to become a man. I was, I was, after all, you know, 12 years old, 5 feet tall, 104 pounds, and I was on the brink of manhood. And uh, Dad decided it was time for me to get off from underneath my mother's wing and uh, ship me off. What the hell are you all over on that side for? One lonely guy down over there. What's your name? What's your name? Charles. Charles is looking at me like, why are you talking to me in the middle of that? <laughs> Somebody go sit with Charles for Christ's sake. <laughs> Thank you. I'll leave you alone now, Charles. I apologize. I mean, Charles is like, what's it? <laughs> anyway. He decided it was time for me to become a man, so I got uh, I got admitted to this boarding school, right? And the way I found out I was going to boarding school was my father walked in my room and said, "Get in the car." <laughs> I got in the car and we whole caravan of family members and we drove and drove and drove and we drove to this place and I get out of the car and he got out of the car and nobody else got out of the car. And he put a suitcase down next to me and shook my hand and said, "This will make a man out of you." Got back in the car and everybody drove off. And uh, the fact was, was that I was being given an opportunity for a wonderful education. Held me in good stead to this very day. The feeling was that I'd just been thrown away by the people who knew me best in the world. And it was devastating emotionally. I was mortified that I'm in this 
It turns out that I'm in a school of 250 boys. They've scoured the earth to find 250 of the brightest, most disturbed young boys they can find. <laughs> right? It's like Lord of the Flies in this joint. You know what I mean? And I'm, every guy in there is 13 to 18. They're all teenagers. And me, I'm the youngest and the smallest kid in the whole school. And I'm, I'm, I mean, that doesn't mean anything to anybody except a 12-year-old. When you're 12, you want to be a teenager. They're all teenagers. I'm not. I lose. I hate this place. Right? So I call home for three days, just terrified of my own shadow. I call home around the clock for three days, talking to my mother, saying, you know, please, you got to come get me. you got to come get me. Big mistake, big mistake. Or no harm, no foul. Just come get me, you know, and everything's good. In the background, you hear my father, hang up. <laughs> my mother's like, all right. And after three days, it was like something broke inside me. And I thought, you know what? You don't want me. I don't want you. I turned my back on my family, and I pretty much never went back. It was like something broke inside. And uh, I had no tools for living. I had no idea how to be in the world. I didn't know how to do anything. I was 12 years old, right? And I'm walking around trying not to make eye contact with anybody. And I met Tiny. Every high school has got a guy named Tiny. You know, he's 6'4", 240, plays guard on the football team. Actually, Tiny found me. And he walked up. He said, how you doing, bunk? And he slapped me in the back of the head. Sent me and my books flying. And I had this, like, out-of-body experience where you watch yourself doing something while your head's saying, no. It's a very... <laughs> It's a very bad idea. And I walked up and I hit Tiny as hard as I could. Which, yeah, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. <laughs> it was like, it had no effect on Tiny. Tiny just kind of looked down at me and he said, you got a lot of guts, kid. And he beat the crap out of me right on the spot. <laughs> and as I'm taking this beating, I'm thinking, this is going pretty good. Because I, I'd taken the beatings before. Mine was not a fun-loving household that I grew up in. Um, um, but the most important thing to me was, was that Tiny had said, you got a lot of guts, kid. My violence had masked my fear. I was terrified of Tiny, but he didn't know that because I'd attacked him. So my first tool for living was, when frightened, attack. No one ever thinks you're frightened if you're climbing across the table at him. So that was my first tool for living. So I go back to my dorm room, and I'm in my dorm room, just, you know, with knots on my head, waiting for the bleeding to stop, thinking my life sucks. And word spread across this campus in like 30 minutes, watch out for this little Hightower kid. He's a maniac. He attacked Tiny. Right? <laughs> which I did not do. And so now I got like this reputation as this little maniac. And, I, and it has nothing. I'm a frightened child. That's who I am. Right? Now, I, But I got this reputation. So the cool guys started coming around. Right? This is 1965. Right? And uh, uh, 1964. This uh, is uh, uh, Matt. Matt came by. And I didn't know who Matt was. It's this guy. Right? Matt comes around. And he sticks his head in my dorm room. And he goes, Yo! You want to smoke a joint? I just looked at him. And I said... Well, yes, I do. <laughs> I do. And I didn't even know what he was talking about, right? I didn't even know what that meant. All I heard was, you want to come with us? And the answer was yes. I was alone in the universe. I had just been thrown away by the people that knew me best in the world. I'd been attacked by a very large person. Some guy walks in, do you want to come with us? Yeah, he could have said, we're going to go kill the Spanish teacher. Do you want to come? I would have said, yes, I do. <laughs> I want to go. I will go with you. And so we left, and we went, and we picked up Steve. And Steve had a Tupperware container wrapped in aluminum foil. And he was carrying it like it was real important. <laughs> and we went behind the dormitory, me and two 13-year-olds, a 12-year-old through two 13-year-olds, Matt and Steve. Children. Children. You know, between the three of us, we shaved like once every other week, you know? <laughs> and and uh, Matt... Uh, fires up the joint, takes a hit, and hands it to me, and I just did what he did, and that was nasty. He's burned my lungs. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's great, that's great, that's great. Yeah. And then, and then Steve's over there, and he's unwrapping the tinfoil. I'm very serious about it. And he's got a Tupperware container full of cheap red wine. I mean, that cheap, no grapes involved red wine. You know what I mean? <laughs> the, the fortified stuff, right? And he takes a pull, and it comes around, and I take a pull on the wine, and it burns my stomach, and I think, God, man, this is nasty. And I'm standing there, and I'm thinking, my life sucks. I got knots on my head, you know, my family's throwing me away, I got the lungs are burning, the stomach's burning, I'm standing there with these two total strangers, man, Steve, Tiny's out there somewhere, you know, I hate my life, I hate my life. And I mean, it happened. <laughs> that thing that makes me bodily different from my fellows occurred, you know. And suddenly I'm comfortable standing where I'm standing, doing what I'm doing with the people I'm doing it with. Never felt like that before in my life. Never felt like that. I never, never felt that good. I was always greatly concerned. 
Not about anything in particular. <laughs> I just had this all constant gnawing great concern, you know? And it, it, and it was just lifted off of me. And I don't know, is it the pot? Is it the wine? Is it the fact that I'm standing here with my two very close personal friends, Matt and Steve? <laughs> so I'm feeling that connection. I am. I don't know, and I don't care. You know? I don't care. I feel good. My, you know, I'd heard all the stories. You know what I mean? You smoke that weed, man. You're 30, 30 minutes, you're on your way downtown looking for heroin. There's no need for heroin. Right then. You drink that evil, you know, that wine, man. You know, next thing you know, you're deep in that rum. You're riding the rails like a hobo. Shiftless. No good. I didn't feel like going anywhere. I felt... I felt very good right there. It was very good. And the knots are fading off my head. I got my two bros right here. You know? I don't, you know, bring them on. Bring Tiny on. You know? <laughs> I feel good. I feel a new vitality. You know? And, and I go to sleep and I wake up the next morning and I'm fine. Fine. No phenomenon of craving that I would hear about many years later. Nothing. Just it worked perfectly. Everything I needed from it, I got. No downside, no bad side. It worked great. I thought, I'm not an idiot. This works. I need to do this as often as I possibly can. <laughs> and I did. Every day for the next 16 years, no matter what. I was given many, many good reasons to stop doing the things I was doing along the way. And I never even touched the brakes. Never touched the brakes. Because I don't get from alcohol what the normal man gets from alcohol. I'm not there doing the same thing. If they, you know, in that portion of chapter three when they say, you know, science may one day accomplish, you know, give us a pill that we can drink like normal men, right? If they ever develop that pill, you can keep the pill. I have no interest in drinking like a normal man. Absolutely no interest in two glasses of wine before dinner. I don't understand that at all. I have, you know, I, I really shouldn't even be commenting on it because I have no experience with it. <laughs> I don't know what the, <laughs> I don't know what that's like. But, I mean, my thing is I got this big motion, this barrel of emotions inside me, right? And, I mean, there's all kinds of emotions swimming around up on the top. And I can drink through those like that, man. That's easy. But, I mean, way down at the bottom of that barrel, that deep undercurrent of my emotional life is fear. That's the thing that ran my life. And that's what I'm drinking at. I'm drinking at the fear. And if it's the last thing I feel, then I have to get drunk to accomplish what I'm there to accomplish. Social drinking... Doesn't do all that does is fuel my desire to kill the fear. That's all it does, right? I got to kill the fear. I got to get drunk. So I got drunk the first time I drank, and I got drunk the last time I drank. And there were many times in the middle there where I didn't quite get drunk, but I was certainly sh trying to. It was my goal. I just didn't get there. <laughs> That's all. I was intervened on by an outside source. I believe in the law. There's a law of a scientific law called the law of inertia. And I believe it's the law of an addict. An addict in motion will stay in motion until acted on by an outside force. <laughs> you know, whether that be God, program of Alcoholics Anonymous, police department, you know, a concrete abutment, you know what I mean? <laughs> Something stopped, you know what I mean? I, there's nothing inside me that's able to stop the process. When I start drinking, I can't tell you how much I'm going to drink when I'm going to stop drinking can't tell you. I can guess. But inevitably, I'm quite wrong. You know? And stopping never really has anything to do with me getting to a place where I can say, no, thank you, I've had enough. I don't, if I can say that, it's not true. I have not had enough. <laughs> anyway, humble beginnings for me, a little pot, a little wine, and off I was running. Now, And I'm going to this boarding school, and one day a guy says, would you like a pill? And I said, well, yeah, I'll have a pill. Took a couple of pills. Twenty minutes later, I'm laying on the floor, very happy down there. <laughs> Took a lot of pills. Doing all second all, Placid Ale, all that stuff, right? Fourteen, I, uh, I went I was on a ten-hour pass and uh, uh, with a girl named Debbie. I love Debbie to this day. Debbie was a bad girl. <laughs> she was a very bad girl. Uh, and I, to, I have great respect for Debbie to this very day. It was an eye-opener in many ways. And I was hanging out with Debbie. And Debbie said, would you like to drop some acid? And I said, well, of course I would, Debbie. <laughs> and again, I have absolutely no idea what we're talking about. I don't know what that means. So she takes a lipstick tube out, spins the tube up, and on the end of it's a little pill. And I took it and swallowed it. She said, did you take that whole thing? 
again, there's a woman over here who's like, oh, no. <laughs> yes, I said, well, yes, I did. She said, well, that's three hits of white lightning. <laughs> there's a woman over here just went, no, that's wrong. Yes, it was. Two days, very, very disturbing couple of days. 600, 650 acid trips later, I got classified legally insane by the military, but that's a whole other story. Fifteen, I started shooting dope, and the only reason I shot dope was I was on a boat in Marina Del Rey, and a girl named Cammie walked up to me and said, would you like me to stick this in your body? And I said, well, yeah, I would. <laughs> and she did, and I just did this. <gasps> <laughs> and on the way down, all I remember thinking was, oh, yeah, man. <laughs> that was like instant what problems. Now, I'm talking about drugs, and I want to qualify this. Um, I identify as an alcoholic. Um, I am, however, a child. Alcohol is what brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous. I am, however, a child of the 60s. We were very, very focused on the drugs. Child of those 60s folk. And the uh, um, thing is, our parents were the alcoholics, and, and, uh, and uh, we were trying to carve out our own identity. We weren't going to drink ourselves to death the way our parents said. We were going to kill ourselves in an entirely new way. So we were focused on the drugs, but here, if the truth be known, any, any real truth I have is in retrospect. I never, I didn't have any idea what was going on when it was going on. But the truth is this. The drugs would come and go. My drug of choice is, what do you got? You know, it's all anti-oral medication. I prefer down and out. I prefer alcohol, heroin, barbiturates, things of these. These are a few of my favorite things. Right? But if you got a big bag of the cocaine, fine. Can't go down? Let's go up. They could be back there. I'm perfectly happy driving around decoding license plates all night. You know? <laughs> I'll be, uh, uh, I'm happy to do that. I'm happy to do that. But see, the fact is, it's it's not about up or down. It's about I got to get out of right here, right now. Because right here, right now, I'm self-centered and I'm afraid. Right here, right now, I'm comparing my insides to your outsides, and I lose every time, every single time. So that was the focus on the drugs, but the drugs would come and go. There was only one thing that was on the table every single day. Alcohol. Alcohol was on the table every single day, and I believe the reason for that is, it's my opinion, that drugs are completely unreliable. <laughs> they are. They're completely unreliable. You don't know what you've got. To, there's no quality control going on out there. <laughs> you don't know what you've got till you get it in your body, right? You do so much cocaine, you can't get your mouth open anymore. You know, and it's 7.30 and the party just started. You've completely overshot the mark one more time, right? Don't worry about it. you got a fifth of gin. You suck a little gin through your teeth. It'll loosen you right up and you can go on with the party. You're fine. Gin is reliable, right? Acid a little too spooky tonight? Don't worry about it. Jack Daniels gets you back in the comfort zone. Just start nursing that bottle. You'll be all right. So in the end for me, by the end, I mean, it was just, you know, three grams of coke a day to keep me on my feet so that I could drink the way I needed to drink. And when I get so sick, I couldn't drink anymore. I'd eat about 150 milligrams of Valium a day until I get leveled out enough I could go back to drinking. It was, I never detoxed. I just retoxed. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was never about getting sober. It was just not an option for somebody like me. I'm wearing out the signers. <laughs> I'm sorry. She just flashed me a little sign there. I just, you see that? <laughs> anyway. I, uh... The hell was I? Probably someplace I shouldn't have been. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean... Ultimately, when it was when it got to the point in the process of my disease, it was all about alcohol for me. Because, I mean, I, there was no time to mess around. You know what I mean? I, I, there was no time to play at it anymore. It got serious. And when it gets serious and it becomes like breathing for you, and you can't get up out of the bed without it, it's got to be alcohol for a guy like me. i got to go with the big dog. Because if it's, if it's not the big dog, it, it's not going to get me where i got to get. Because I'm just way too strung out. Anyway, I dropped out of high school when I was 16. Got committed to my first mental institution. Um, they, they had me in for three months of observation and a year of rehabilitation. Um, which I thought was a little excessive. And they uh, um, they got the signs here, the green lit up exit signs. That's what was in the nut house. They had those, which I thought summed it up nicely. It's all I wanted to do. Exit. They lying it in there. Three cups of pills a day, shuffling around in there, you know what I mean, with, with people who were, you know, clearly insane. 
You know, I was just a little, you know, alcoholic drug addict, and they didn't know what to do with me, so they throw you in the nut house, right? So I'm in there shuffling around, and I'm planning my escape, and I'm having all my meals with this lady named Kilday. And Kilday was really nuts. Kilday was, <laughs> Marcel's looking at me. Kill, yeah, Kilday was crazy. All he had to do to flip Kilday out was look at her and say, Kilday, how you doing? Kilday. Wow! Man. And she'd just freak out and run off, and all the guards and everybody run to, you know, subdue Kilday. So I used Kilday as my diversion when I escaped, when I tried to escape. And I got my little three cups of pills. I'm shuffling around in there, and I'm at lunch one day, and we're having lunch, and I got Kilday flipped out. And she spun off that one and is ready, ready, go. <laughs> you know? And I'm hauling ass. That's all I got, you know? And it's this shocking moment when you look at when you go to make your move, and it ain't there. <laughs> the arms are working, and it's like, what the hell, man? I got those little three cups of pills a day. You know what I mean? You got two speeds, slow and stopped. And you hear from the nurse's station over the last week, you hear, uh, Ed, when you got a minute, you want to grab Earl? He's making a break for the door. <laughs> and Ed's in there having a sandwich going, yeah, I'll give him a minute. He ain't going anywhere. It's like completely demoralizing. And I, obviously, clearly, I did not have a complete grasp of the situation. And back to the room with no doorknob, you know, hang out a little while longer. Finally get out, run around, do the stuff that I do. The net thrown over me again, back in the nut house. Now I know. My, I'm like 16 years old. My tools for living are drugs, alcohol, violence, and run. And now I know if you're going to get thrown in the nut house like I do, you got to get out before they get the Thorazine in you, or you're leaving when they say. So I'm in the intake process the second time in. And I'm sitting in there, and I'm going, yeah, yeah, I'm really glad you got me. It's really rough out there. Hey, look at that. <laughs> and I take off, and the whistles are going, you know what I mean? And i got a guy on my ass chasing me across... I hit this door, and I'm out in this lawn, and there's a 12-foot ivy-colored chain-link fence over there, and I'm just running for this fence, and I got this guy right on my tail, right? At this point, I'm like 16, 17 years old. I'm a high school dropout. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. I'm at any moment, hopefully, an, um, um, an escape mental patient. <laughs> this is like my resume, you know? This is what I've accomplished so far. And I'm thinking if I make that fence, I don't have a problem, because I'll be loaded in 20 minutes. Los Angeles, you know? Not difficult. Make the fence, I'm out, hit the streets for three years doing what we do. Go to a party, meet this woman, we talk for 20 minutes, so we're in love. <laughs> we decide, well, we've got to build a life around this deep, meaningful relationship we're having now. So uh, um, I go on an interview for a very good business college in Northern California, not far from here, um, across the way. And uh, I get accepted on the interview. You know how we talk, you know what I mean? He, he was a musician, so I was a musician. You know, his favorite color is blue. That's astonishing. It's my very favorite color, blue. You know, he's lined up with him, and he knew that I would be. He, I remember him saying, you'll be a fine addition to our campus in the fall. And I remember thinking, if I got this guy snowed. So I go back to Emily, and I say to my father, look, I got accepted to business college. Don't ask. Give me a year's tuition, and I'm out of town. He said, beautiful. Wrote me a check. Me and my lovely wife-to-be, I actually married her for one day. I left after the reception. She knew me pretty well, though. It didn't surprise her at all. Her name was Rosemary. When I, they just said, he's, he's gone? <laughs> he's gone? I mean, I looked around the reception. I thought, we peaked. I'm out of here. <laughs> and she, uh, she just like, well, that's Earl. You know, it was like no big deal to her. <laughs> she didn't expect me to stay. I don't know what she was thinking about. But she was the woman who used to say to me things like, I'm too high. So, I mean, I knew it wasn't going to work. <laughs> so it wasn't going to work. She's still alive. It's remarkable. Not many people back from that then are. Anyway, um, we move up north. We threw all our belongings and eight pounds of hash in the back of this truck and drove to Northern California. She gets a straight job. I'm going to college. They give me a year's tuition up front. I say the transcripts are in the mail. I go down to the local high school to get my GED. I don't even have a high school diploma when I'm going to college, right? I got this whole scam going with the college. I become a drug dealer. I have no, I have no problem becoming a drug dealer because at this point in my life, by now, I mean, I have no ethics. I have no morals of any kind. I have no, con I have no sense of family. I have no sense of community. I'm just out there on my own, doing what I do, trying to find my way. I've got, you know, like, i got like a head of state as a client. <laughs> you know what I mean? i got clients. I'm studying marketing production, business, you know, business production, distribution uh, in school. My business, my business is booming. I'm loving college, right? <laughs> 
Show me all the little tricks of the trade. Um, it's very funny, though, when you sit in a drug deal and start discussing with a guy who's just whacked, start discussing Veblen's Law of Conspicuous Consumption. And they look at you like, huh? <laughs> Never mind. It's just a, I was real high in class one day, and that one stuck. Right? <laughs> And uh, um, I'm 20 years old and uh, got diagnosed with malignant cancer. So I flew back to L.A., had major surgery in my upper back. They told my parents that I was probably going to die. They prepared me to die. And I remember looking at them and thinking, you don't even know who you're talking to. I'm 20 years old, and I've already overdosed so many times. It's like dying, it's like, you know, that comes up like twice a week the way I'm living. You know, it's not really a threat to somebody like me. And so they put me, they do major surgery in my back. They put me in the nuclear medicine program, they called it back then. Now it's chemotherapy. Then it was nuclear medicine. Uh, it's, uh, very intense. And I used to make them come out in the hall and give me the shoot me up with the stuff. And I, I didn't, I didn't like the buzz I was getting off their medic meds, so I stopped doing it. Went home and got loaded the way I get loaded, and I beat the cancer thing. I'm a long-term cancer survivor. Anyway, sailing along, go back. I'll go to USC for a while while I'm recovering from the surgery and get done. I go back up, come up back up north here to go to school. I got an early acceptance. Go to USC law school. I'm editor-in-chief of my college newspaper, you know what I mean? I got a nice front set up, you know what I mean? Like people look at me going, you know, the way you're using is out of line. I'm going, hey, 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 malignant cancer. You got malignant cancer? No? Okay? Then you don't understand the stress I'm under. You going to law school? I don't believe you are. A lot of stress over here, right? I got a newspaper to run. <laughs> what are you talking about? I got all this stuff. People just like, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And they just back off me and let me drink the way I wanted to drink. And that was all, all that stuff was for anyway, was to say to you, look what I'm doing, leave me alone. Let me drink the way I want to drink. So my mother calls me and says, look, we haven't been anywhere as a family in 10 years. Your 22nd birthday is coming up. Let's just go somewhere as a family, put this family back together, crying, doing all that mother stuff. I said, fine. So I flew back to L.A. and I was having one of those, you know, jaw lock-up mornings. You know what I mean? It's been a, been a long night. And I showed up just gacked. And uh, we got in a plane to fly to uh, L.A. to uh, uh, from L.A. to Guadalajara uh, in Mexico. And on the way there, the plane crashed. And my mother, my father, my little sister were all killed in the crash, and I wasn't. And I woke up on a mountain in Mexico, and my mother was laying right over there, and my little sister Kimberly was laying right over there, and my father was laying right over there. And I had a fractured skull. My back was broken in three places. I had a crushed leg and arm. I had a lot of internal injuries. I had uh, metal sticking through my arm. Um, I was paralyzed in the waist down, and I was awake. And the only thing I could move was my right arm, and I could not get to any of them to help them. I couldn't get, I wanted to try to help them in some way, and I couldn't get to them. And I, I laid there, and I watched them all bleed to death. And I had a little conversation with God, and I said, you know what, any God that would take a kind, gentle creature like my little sister Kimberly and leave a lion, she didn't even dope being like me on the planet. I got no use for a God of this type, and I renounced God. And then some guys came up, and they scavenged the plane wreck. They took what they could find that they thought was of value, took the money out of my wallet, threw it back on my chest, and left me up there to die. And I had no more love for you either. I was out of the game, man. I mean, I'd never been any good at you. You know what I mean? I'd never been any good at you. Unless I was really well medicated, I couldn't really even leave the house and get next to you at all, interact with you, exchange thoughts, ideas, feelings of any kind with you. I'd never been any good at other people. And, and now I saw absolutely no reason to even get into it with you at all, at all. I was an extremely angry, hostile little alcoholic, 22 years old, dying on a mountain in Mexico, man. I was just enraged. And finally some guys came up and they put me in the back of a flatbed truck with my mother and they drove me down the mountain and they uh, tagged her dead and they tagged me dead and they sat there smoking cigarettes waiting for us to die in a Mexican aid station because it's a lot more paperwork if they actually take you to our hospital. And I didn't die. They finally took me to this place called Hospital Fatima in Los Mochas, Mexico. I've actually flown over it since, in, uh, um, last year. And uh, they took me in there, and uh, um, I came around, and they, there was a scene in that joint. scene in that joint. They found out my name, and that brought the Federales. And the Federales interrogated me through an interpreter for three and a half days and wouldn't give me anything for pain because they wanted to know what I was doing back in Mexico, which is another story we don't need to get into here with. Little, little, little difficulty with the Mexican authorities. Anyway, so I uh, finally called a friend of mine in Northern California from up here, um, an associate out of, from Mexico City who was living up in this area. And he called down to Mexico City and they flew in a plane and 
paid some guys off and plastered me from the neck down, smuggled me out of Mexico and got me into a hospital in Southern California. They told me I may or may not walk again. I'd have a withered left hand and be blind in my left eye. And I remember I was just so rageful. I remember thinking, you don't even know who you're talking to, man. The way I've lived, there's nothing. I'm walking out of this joint. And I did. I got a back brace and I got a cane. and it's crazy. And I spent a long time in there. I came out of there strung out on Demerol and I went on my last run and it lasted for six years. Um, and you got to understand, the way I was drinking and using, I didn't have any anchors. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have a family I was trying to keep it together for, or a job or a career I was trying to keep it together for, or a wife or kids. or There was nothing in my life that said, you got to hold it together. I was just loose and letting it rip. And my job was to just be in the world and let you know how little I cared about what you thought. You know, you got drugs, alcohol, sex, you know, money, information on how I can get any or all of the above. Let's talk. You don't. Next. Step off. I got, I don't want to get to know you. Why the hell would I want to get to know you? I knew, they knew me better than anybody in the world and they threw me away. <laughs> what would possibly motivate me to want to get to know? Do not confuse me with someone who wants to hear about your day. I don't want to hear about your day. I've watched you all sit around telling each other about your day. Not interested. Don't care. You having a bad day? Pfft. So what? I don't care. You want to hear about a bad day? I think about a bad day. Bad day sitting here listening to you. <laughs> Get away from me. I mean, and I just, I sealed up tight. And I was alone, and I stayed alone, and I drank and used like a madman. I was sober on three occasions in the last six years. They were for 72 hours each. There was a little bootleg sanitarium in Hollywood you could go in, give them your wallet and your car keys, your gun, your money, give them 150 cash, and they take you and strap you to a gurney, shoot you full of anticonvulsants, and let you rock. And you kick like a dog. And if you got out of it alive, they'd send you home. If not, they'd send you to the morgue, and they didn't really care which way you went. And I kicked like a dog in there three times. I remember the last time I kicked in there, I reintroduced myself to God, and I said, you know what? I can't take the madness anymore, man. I can't take the violence. I can't take the extreme nature of this life. I cannot take it anymore. I know I'm an alcoholic. I know I'm a drug addict. If you get me out of this sane and alive, I will never, ever, ever, ever drink again as long as I live. And I mean that with every fiber of my being, and I did. And I got up off that gurney, and I was still alive, and I drank for another two years. I could not stop drinking. Couldn't stop. Could not stop. Could not be in the world without alcohol. Could not do it. In the end, I was drinking. I'd, I'd wake up. I couldn't go to sleep unless I had a bottle waiting. I couldn't drink it all. If I woke up and there was no alcohol in the house, it was a terrifying experience for me. Because now you have to get up, get dressed, find the car, get to the liquor store, get the guy to open up, get the guy to give you the bottle, get back in the car, crack the bottle, start drinking. It's too much. I can't do all that. I have to wake up and grab the bottle. And I'll do eight ounces of Jack, hold on to it as long as I can, throw it up. Drink another eight ounces, hang on to it as long as I can, throw it up. By now, my stomach is anesthetized just enough that I can throw another eight ounces down and it'll sit. And I can start to get the madness off of me. And I can start to just, because I'm not drinking to catch a buzz anymore. There's no buzz in it. I'm drinking to get to zero. I'm trying to get the pain and the madness off me. I'm trying to get to zero, because that's as high as I ever get anymore. And I did that right up until the bitter end. And when I, I came out of my last blackout, I was 27 years old. Both my hand I'd broken 74 bones. I had over 650 stitches in me. I'd been stabbed twice, shot at. The violence had been insane. They were deciding whether or not to charge me with attempted murder again. Um, my family was dead. I had no friends. I had no place to live. Um, and that was just the outside stuff, you know. That was the easy part. The hard part was that I had become such a soulless, dark, lonely, isolated human being. I wasn't connected to another human being on the face of the earth, and I hadn't been for years. And that's what broke my back. That's what absolutely broke my back, was that lack of connection. I, it's, I just couldn't bear it another second. And I threw up two busted hands, and I said, help. And they took me, and they pumped my stomach, and they said, get him out of here, he's going to die. They took me to another place, kept me five days of detox, said, it's getting worse, get him out of here. They took me by ambulance to another place. It was a room at Long Beach General Hospital with 42 cots in it, 21 cots on each side of the room with a sheet drawn between it. And they were free. And my cousin, my second cousin, knew the doc who was running the deal. And they got me in. And how you earned your cot was you stayed in it. And you didn't get any meds. You didn't get shit. 
lay there and kick. That's how you earn your cot. And if you buck up right out of that cot and have it throw a seizure, they'll hit you with some anticonvulsants and throw you back up in the cot. How bad do you want this cot? That's how you... So, I mean, I, hang, I hung on to my cot, bucked right out. They gave me the anticonvulsants, threw me back in the cot. And I stayed ten, uh, 12 more days in that cot. And how you got out of detox and into rehab was they'd give you one of those little styrofoam cups, you know, and they'd fill it about that about a third full with, with decaf. And if you could, with one hand, pick it up and get a sip without spilling any of it, on to rehab. <laughs> you were through detox. <laughs> and I remember I'm sitting in there, and I mean, you'd see guys break fingers, you know what I mean, holding on to the chair they were sitting in. And they'd throw a seizure and just snap fingers, right? So, so nobody slept. Sleep with that. 42 guys in one room kicking? Uh, please. <laughs> you're not sleeping, right? It was, it was Dante's Inferno in there, man. <laughs> I mean, you're looking around going, I belong in here with that guy. <laughs> you know? You realize, that guy's nuts. He's gone, and you belong here with him. You fit right in with these guys, right? And you go on to rehab, and you meet the doc. And I remember we were sitting in the room, and I was just freaked out. Because I had nothing left. There was nothing. It was like, mm, let's see, what do I do today? Right? Like I got some kind of a social calendar going on. You know what I mean? It's over. And then there's this doc, uh, Dr. Vicki Fox. She was saved a lot of alcoholics, man. She came walking in the room. And everybody, she's the kind of woman, she walked in the room and all, all the little guys in there kicking just all went, <gasps> she had like a hair up and a big beehive thing on her head, like a pencil stuck in it and always wore a sweater, and she had the glasses on the chain, right? And always had a stack of files, with manila files in her arm, and a cigarette. She'd stick a cigarette in the corner of her mouth, light it, and just leave it there. Ashes on the sweater, you know what I mean? She's always, she walked in, and she's from Georgia, and she looked right at me, and I thought I was going to have a heart attack, man. <laughs> she just went, and I just, <gasps> and she walked over, and she looked at me, she reached over, and she put her hand on my cheek, and it felt cool. I mean, she put her hand on my cheek, and I just kind of went, like a dog, just, you know, when <laughs> you know, <but> stuck her. <laughs> and she said, baby, you really do need to be here. And I just went, yeah, yeah. It was like my first direction. It was like I was a puppy, you know, and he's like, stay. Okay, I got that one, I'll stay. And they said, go left, and I went left. And when I left, they said, Earl, if you don't want to die, you better go to Alcoholics Anonymous, because that's the only place a guy like you has a shot at life. I said, okay. I had been beaten into a state of reasonableness by alcoholism. And I ended up in the basement of a church on a Friday night, an 8.30 meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, Try God Group in Culver City, California. Walked in the back door, walked in, and I was nuts. Nuts. And I walked in the back, and I sat down in the back, my back against the wall, because I had, I had kicked, but I had a head full of alcoholism, man. I was just raging, raging. All my old ways and other ideas. I knew where I walked in. The first thing I wanted to know is where are the doors and windows? I walk in the room, I want to know every way in and every way out. Now I want to know who's got the juice in here. Who's got the juice. So I'm watching these people operate, and I'm trying to find out who's the guy whose conversation I will be burglarizing. Right? He's got the juice. He's got the power. He knows what's going on. I'll just slide up next to him, and I'll just listen to what he's got to say, and I will burglarize your conversations and get what information you have about how you live in this world and don't drink, and then I'm out of here, because I don't join stuff. Right? And that was my big plan. And to keep all you off of me, because I don't want... All right? Don't want to chit-chat. Don't like the chit-chat thing. And y'all chit-chat a lot. And I'm in the back, and the guy, all the old-timers, they knew who I was. I was a frightened newcomer. That's, they said, I'm no tough guy. It's a frightened newcomer. And they're all like, glad you're here, brother. Get yourself a cup of coffee and have a seat. I just, <laughs> Except for one guy, right? One guy saw me, and all he saw was, new guy, right? Because he had about nine months, and it just caught fire with AA. He's going to give it away tonight. So he comes racing down the aisle of me with his hand out, right? And I'm mad-dogging this guy like crazy, right? Like, do not come over here. Don't do it. Bad thing going to happen. You come this. I'm trying to get, get him off course anyway. I just... He's not having it. He walks right up and goes, hi, I'm Vegas. I'm an alcoholic. And I said, so what? Ain't exactly the highlight of my life. I don't know what you're so thrilled about. Get away from me. And he looked at me and said, keep coming back. And you got the three guys standing over there who all go, man, that was good. You see that? He told them to keep coming back. It's very good. <laughs> you know, and I'm watching this thinking, this sucks. Right? Keep coming back. Right? I mean, when I'm pacing and getting my hour of sleep tonight, 
which is all I'm getting at this point, right? I'm pacing the room about to lose my mind. I'm sure that keep coming back thing is going to be really handy. Thanks a lot, Vegas, right? And apparently there's some deep spiritual significance to keep coming back. Those three guys commented on it. We all saw that. So you all know the deep spiritual significance to keep coming back. I don't. You win. I'm the loser. I'm liking this AA thing so far. I, I hate you. <laughs> Luckily for me, I got no place else left to go. Well, I got to sit here and put up with you idiots. So I'm sitting in the back, right? If you're new and they do that to you, I hope you have more courage than I did. Where they come up and they go, hey, keep coming back. One day at a time. And my personal favorite, hey, just turn it over, will you? <laughs> Step up. Say, excuse me, I don't understand the deep spiritual significance of just turn it over. Would you mind expanding on that for me a little bit? Where I got sober, if they tell the truth, about 75% of them would say, well, I don't know what it means either. <laughs> they said it to me when I came in, I'm just saying it to you, I don't know what the hell it means. Hey, there's a guy over there who reads the big book, let's ask him, maybe he knows. Usually it's hanging on a scroll about three by seven feet right on the wall right there, right? Anyway, just, just my opinion. So I, uh, I stayed and I sat there. And this old-timer got up and he shared his experience, strength, and hope. I didn't know what the hell he was talking I didn't know that's what it was, right? But I remember this guy getting up there and he had a grace and a dignity about him. And he, was a, he seemed to be comfortable with himself. And he just seemed to be able to tell the truth about how, the feelings, his feelings as a man. How he would wake up in the morning with his head just chewing on him. You know? I mean, he would just open his eyes and his head would say, We're glad you're awake. We've got a few things we want to talk to you about right now. First of all, you're a miserable piece of shit and you'll never amount to anything. You know, just incoming. You know what I mean? It's just it's on him, right? And he would get up and say, thanks for sharing, you know what I mean? He'd go and take a shower and get dressed, go to work, give him an honest day's work, go get something to eat, go to a meeting early, right? Be there talking to new guys. And he wouldn't go to a meeting to see what the meeting had for him, what he got for me tonight. He would go to a meeting to be of service to the meeting because he'd worked the 12 steps as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. He'd been restored to sanity, soundness of mind. He'd been relieved of the obsession to drink. He had had a spiritual awakening as the result of working on the steps. And he wasn't there to take anymore. He was there to be a service, to give. So he'd come to meetings to be there for the newcomers, to let them know that there was a, you know, a light ahead. There was a light up ahead, and he would be there for them. And then he would go home, and he would be in service to them, and he would go home, and uh, um, no wreckage. Head chewing on him all day, no wreckage. That was astonishing to me. Because up all day, head chewing on you, no wreckage. Didn't snap at anybody, didn't hit anybody, didn't threaten anybody. And steal anything. Right? I mean, a look can be a violent act. You know? Some of us. I thought, that's amazing. I mean, I wake up, wreckage. It just happens every day. Because I'm so frightened all the time. Right? I just create problems all around. Because you, you keep coming up to me and asking me questions I can't answer. Like, how are you? <laughs> What's going on? How you doing? Jesus, man, I mean, put on the spot constantly. Oh. And I thought, that's amazing. But, I mean, I sat back there with my arms folded, my best, you know, look of disdain, right, thinking, this, this is amazing. And then it was like he looked right at me and he said, you know what, I don't care whether you like what I got to say or not. If you don't like it, go to another meeting. I thought, this is great. I love that. Because it made it clear to me, this guy's not selling me something. He's sharing it with me. If I want it, I can have it. It's for free. Don't want it? Cool, go to another meeting, maybe you'll hear somebody you can identify with there. Good luck to you. I thought, this is cool, I'm coming back. And, I've never left. I've stayed with you ever since. If I don't do anything stupid, well, let's just put it, I've been sober 21 years, 11 months. And, believe me, you're not applauding me or my best thinking, okay? You guys are applauding yourselves, because... The reason that I have 21 years and 11 months of sobriety has absolutely nothing to do with anything I brought to you. It has everything to do with what you offered me when I got here. That's what it has to do with. Alcoholics Anonymous is the reason that I'm alive and sober and walking the earth a free man. And I got here, and you guys made it pretty simple for me. You said, you know, they got it here. I mean, some of these things are strangely (laughs) funeral-like. Which I, of course, took quite personally. (laughs) You're going to die, Earl. 
You've been telling me that since 1968. What the hell was I talking about? <laughs> Not that it matters. I just was... Anyway, they got it real simple for me, right? There's like this triangle with a circle. Ancient spiritual symbol stands for mind, body, and spirit. Brought together as a whole human being. Therein lies the balance I sought my whole life and never had. Drunk or sober. It's a maniac. A newly sober? I was a newly sober maniac. You take a drunk at one like him. I'm really trying to watch my language, right? Which is good. Which is good. <laughs> Screw it. I, uh... <laughs> AA adopted the symbol. It's unity, service, and recovery. It's the same thing. Unity is the body. I bring it here. I couldn't get sober, but we seem to be able to together. I do this with you. I do this in your company, or I don't do it at all. Every guy that I know, every guy that I know, that I've sponsored or worked with or been friends with, who's gone out and come back, I ask them what happened. They all say the same thing. Well, first they stopped going to meetings. They disconnected from their fellows. I couldn't get said We admitted we were powerless. Page 30 in the book, it says, I must accept to my innermost self that I'm an alcoholic. That's the first step in recovery. Yeah, but the steps, we admitted that. Right? So the unity is the body. i got to bring it here. It's, forget what, I don't have to like this. I don't have to think it's a good idea. I have to do it. I have to have my feet end up here. I love the guy who shares an meeting. I'm a Lou alcoholic. First of all, I just want to say, screw you. <laughs> Hate your goddamn meeting. You, you, you in particular, despise you. Right? Sick of it's not going to work. Hate it. Thank you for letting me share. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the meeting at that point goes, all right. <laughs> Excellent. I love that guy because he's bringing what he's got. He, he was at home feeling that way. He got up off his ass, got in the car, and went to an AA meeting. <laughs> Said, anybody have anything like to share? He said, yeah, well, sure. <laughs> Spoke his truth. And then shut up and let other people talk. <laughs> I'm all for that guy. So keep coming back, bro. That that it will change. It all does. It all does. I love those guys. So unity is the body. I bring it here. I just got to keep coming. I got to stay connected to you. The recoveries of the mind. The greater aspect of my disease. I have to be. See, I know me. I know kicking ain't even half of it. If kicking was all there was, detox centers would be kicking out winners. It wouldn't be the Betty Ford Center. It would be the Betty Ford Bed and Breakfast Center. <laughs> you just go in for the weekend, you know, have a few nice meals, kick. You'd be cool, and they'd say, now, Earl, you know you're an alcoholic, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you know that uh, to drink is to die, don't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. I do. Now, now, now armed with this self-knowledge, Earl, you're going to be a good boy, and you're not going to drink anymore, are you? No, no, no. So you're just going to, you go out there and you don't drink no matter what in the world. Oh, oh, yeah. And I'm drunk in the parking lot. <laughs> Is that Earl drinking in the parking lot? Yeah. I, I, I got to get, if I can't get comfortable sober, I'm not staying that way. And the only way a guy like me is going to get comfortable clean is if I can be relieved of the obsession of the mind, the greater aspect of my disease. I can't have that beast whisper in my ear all the time. I can't have it. I can't fight that off every minute because they talk about these strange mental lapses that we have, these blank spots that we hit. They talk in the book about that time that comes when there's no human defense against the drink, right? I can't be all day with the beast going, How you doing, boy? How you doing? You all right, Earl? You all right? You know, I think you're having a bad day, bro. And I'm sweet. I got a commitment cleaning up Ohio Street. My sponsor's standing right over there, right? And beast whispering in my ear. I'm looking at my sponsor. He's going, "Okay, now let's just keep this between you and me. Don't say nothing to him." All right? <laughs> Smile and wave. Hey, I don't know how I. Okay, yeah, that was good. Now let's go back to sweeping up. Now I just want to talk to you for a minute. Now you've been, you know, you've been. I don't know what it is, man. You're a nice guy. You're a good guy. You're a lovely person. And people just been treating you horribly all day, and I don't know what it is. It's like you got a bullseye, and they've been shooting bullseyes all day long. Making cracks, you being disrespectful, being rude, being hurtful. I don't understand. It's a cruel world, girl. It's a cruel world. And I can see that you're very, very stressed out about it, and we all know that stress is very, very, very... It's, it's, hard. it's, it's not healthy, Earl. It's just plain not healthy. This is a health issue. The stress. And here's what we're going to do. We're just going to go out and have a couple of drinks. Take it easy. Don't, don't overreact. We're just going to go have two drinks. 
two drinks. We're going to go do it in public. We're going to have it in a, in a nice... We're going to have cocktails. Not even drinks. We'll have cocktails. L they're lovely. Uh, two lovely cocktails. In a glass, ice, everything. And we're just going to unwind. And I'm gonna, we're going to talk this through. And we're going to get through this, y'all, because I'm here for you. Because I love you. I've always been here for you. I've always been here for you. We're going to love you. And I'm sweeping up on high street looking at my sponsor going, Yeah, yeah. I can't, I can't have that on me all the time. Because life on life's terms is going to happen. You know what I mean? And when the shit hits the fan and I realize I'm not in charge of the fan, I'm going to start listening to this voice. I gotta be relieved of the obsession of drink. I gotta quiet that voice down. The only way I know, there's only a couple of ways to do it. The recovery of the mind, the greater aspect of the mind disease. What I do, work the steps. While I'm working the steps, what can I do? When that's going on, I can be in the meeting and I can go, excuse me, Donald? My original response, Donald, beast, whispering, right here. It's happening, he's doing it right now. I'm not, su I'm surprised you can't hear him. Because he's pissed now, he's yelling at me. We're talking to you. If you're going to talk to him, then we're not talking. Which is the idea. So i got to work the steps. The steps are simple. The only way to be relieved of the obsession of drinks is to work the steps. Step one is, what's the problem? Lack of power is my dilemma. I maybe have it together in every other area, but when it comes to the question of drinking, I'm nuts. Right? That's my problem. Alcoholism is my problem. If that's my problem, what's my solution? If I'm powerless, if that's the problem, lack of power, what's my solution? Step two, a power greater than myself that can restore me to sanity, soundness of mind, relieve me of this obsession to drink. Take it off the table so that when I review the options I have available to me for whatever situation is before me, I don't see drinking and using on that table as an option to solve this problem because it will solve no problem that I have or have ever had, ever. Won't do it. So I know what my problem is. I know what my solution is. Step three says you better make a decision to do something about this because faith without works is dead. You've got to take action. What action do I take? Get it on my knees. Turn my will and my life over the care of a God I may or may not understand. I don't know about you, but I have a little trouble wrapping my head around infinity. I've tried. You know? I get out there a little too far. I get spooked. I jump back. I don't need to understand it. I just need to see evidence of this power working in my life. Which I do all the time. One of the great things about going to meetings is, is you see evidence of a power greater than us at work. Every day somebody's going, you know, I've had the obsession to use for nine years. Got on my knees to turn the will of my will and my life over the care of God. I haven't had the obsession to use in a week. I mean, you hear that stuff from people and you just go, wow. Not my experience, but very cool for you. <laughs> you know? Evidence. It's there. Right? So four and five is me, six and seven is God, and eight and nine is you, this action plan that i got to embark upon. Four and five, I swallow large chunks of truth about myself, and before God, read them to another individual, I get them out. Six and seven, I hook it back up with God. Ask God to remove the defects of character, because I'll remove the wrong stuff. Eight and nine, hook it back up with you. Notice, you're last. First, got to get it squared away here. Hook it up here. Now, here I come. Right? Very, very sorry. Here's your money. Back in the house. You know, no big lofty tales about, hey, get a load of me on my bitchin' little spiritual quest here. When you, when you hear this, you're going to think I'm the greatest. Really, you're going to love me, right? No. No. I'm sorry for the harm and trouble I have caused. I'm asking, what can I do to make this right? I'm sorry I stole your car or estimate the value of the car at $5,000 at the time of the theft. If that's agreeable to you, I will give you a check now and a check every month until that $5,000 is paid. And I will not steal a car from you and sell it to pay you for the car I stole from you. <laughs> to make amends means to change. i got to change. i got to change. I'm going to anyway. I might as well try to put a positive angle on things, right? 10, 11, and 12 keep me in the game because I've just made a pass at this stuff. 10, me, God, 11, God, 12, you. Same stuff. 10, I continue to take personal inventory and when wrong, promptly admit it. Key word there. Eleven, I seek God. How? Through prayer and meditation. Why? What do, how do I do that? Through prayer and meditation. I pray for knowledge of His will for me and the power to carry that out. That's it. And I meditate to quiet the mind so that when the answers come, I can hear them. Twelve is the third side of the triangle. Unity is the body. I bring it here. Recoveries of the mind. I work the twelve steps. Having had an awakening is the result of doing that. Restored to sanity, soundness of mind. Relieved of the obsession of drink. Walk in the earth a free man. I can be a service to other people. Because now I can give away something because I've got it. How can I help? Not because I'm a good guy. Because I don't want to die drunk. I don't want to die like that. That's why a guy like me that is absolutely terrified of flying will get up on a Saturday morning, get on an airplane, 
which is just an absurd thing to do. It's a big metal cylinder with jet engines on it. They just point it and just let it rip. They just <laughs> rock it across the sky at 500 miles an hour with little people in uniforms walking down the aisle smiling at you like, this is okay. <laughs> it's completely wrong. Sitting next to me in a plane is a horrible thing to do. Because people will start, they'll start bumping, and I'll look at somebody else and I'll say, you know, this is wrong, don't you? And they go, no, 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 everything's okay. And I go, oh, well, listen to this. By the time we're done, they're strapped in so tight, man. they got no blood flow to their legs. It's like, you know, my number's up, my number's up. But, that, I mean, I can get on a plane and fly here because I, I get to face my worst fear on a regular basis so that I know I'm willing to go to anyone who likes to stay sober. It's been a great gift in my life. People think it's, like, horrible. I travel as much as I do. I do like 100,000 miles a year for AA, right? I get to know. I get to know. Other people have to wonder. I get to know that I'm willing to go to any lengths to stay sober. And I am. I am. Because it's, it's, it's the foundation of my life. I walked here as a free man. I was a slave to drug and alcohol for 16 years. 16 years on a daily basis. I had no idea that I could live as a free man. And I've been free for 21 years. You know, and my life is good. I've had some terrible days sober. Absolutely terrible days. Life has terrible days. In life, there is suffering, unavoidable. And I have suffered sober for days. I've had 21 wonderful years. There's a big difference. If you're new, take your turn. Come catch a buzz, man. There's a big, serious buzz going on here. This ain't about just not drinking and using. This is a design for living. There are spiritual ideas and universal truths afoot here that have gone on since man's been able to write stuff down or communicate to one another. Thousands of years, these truths have been presented to us over and over and over again in many different forms. They've been put together in a way specifically for us. It's called the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's that doctor's opinion in that 164 pages and the 12 steps that are outlined there. This process that we undertake that changes us, that allows us addicts, alcoholics to walk the earth free men and women. It's an amazing thing. you got to take your turn. And you don't have to be good at it. This ain't about being good at it. We're about immediate gratification. I mean, I, 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 when I'm using, I think I can make any situation that's good, I can make it better in six seconds. If i got a bad situation going on, I can definitely have 11 seconds, it's gone. No memory of that feeling whatsoever. Know how to do that. In here, we go through the process of having that available to us at all times. Using, the best buzz I ever got was right up front. That bottle of wine, that cheap red wine, that joint. Best buzz I ever had, and I chased the tail of that dragon for 16 years. Slowly over time, the price I paid for that buzz got greater and greater and greater, and the buzz I got became less and less and less. So at the end, I was paying a horrible price just to get to zero. In here, you work real hard up front. It's the exact opposite. In here, you struggle in the beginning. You got no tools for living. All you got is a is a genuine, well deserved terror of that beast's right outside that door, and you're scared to death. You're going to have to go back into the madness because that's been your experience up to this point. So you come in here and you scratch and you claw and you wrestle with concepts that you're not really comfortable with and you don't know that much about, and you scrap and you claw and you get a you get the, you get the unthinkable. The unattainable happens for you. You get a 30-day chip. Most powerful event in Alcoholics Anonymous, in my opinion. You get that 30-day chip. And you get a little bit of buzz after a huge amount of effort. And then you get a 60-day chip. And a 90-day chip. And a 6-month chip. And a 9-month chip. And then you get the unthinkable. A year of sobriety. And then you keep going and you keep going and you realize life is happening. While you're focusing on your recovery, your relationships are healing. Your mind is calming down. You don't have the yips anymore. You know what I mean? You're not just talking to people, you know, standing around just... Because your brain got momentarily confused and didn't know what to do, and it said, shit, throw something. Your brain's calming down. You're starting to interact with other people. They come up and they ask you how you're feeling, and you can actually tell them. And then you do the, uh, the, the impossible. You ask them, and how are you? And you actually stand there waiting for them to tell you because you're mildly interested. <laughs> it's astonishing. You realize that the distance between us no longer separates us. It connects us now. You start catching the buzz, and all of a sudden, you don't need the peak experience. Out there, I need the only way I could feel anything is, I mean, 
the only I, th- I had an exciting night if I heard a bullet go by. Well, that was exciting, right? Yeah, because I was so dead inside, it would take an event like that to, you know, make me feel like, wow, that was cool. You know, where I'm in an emergency room getting another 50 stitches thinking, you know, I had a great night, you know? In here, you get to learn how to marvel in the ordinary. Last story. Stand in front of my house, Studio City, California. First house. Have a front lawn. Now, to somebody like me, this is, a, this is like uncharted territory. You know what I mean? This lawn area. So I go out one day to inspect the front lawn area. And I'm standing on the front lawn, and there's like plants and grass and, you know, flowers and things. And a little fence. The hose over there. And clearly, you turn the hose on. Water comes out the hose, and you sprinkle the water around. And that's, I see, I've driven by places and seen guys doing this, right? So I hit the hose, and I turn it on, and I'm sprinkling the water. Around, you know, a little there, a little there. And all of a sudden, catch the buzz. I catch the buzz. I go, hey, this shit's alive. They're taking in carbon dioxide. And they're breathing out oxygen. I'm breathing in oxygen. Kicking out carbon dioxide. Got a little thing going here. <laughs> Me and my brothers and sisters here. I give them water, they love me, they go, here's a little for you, my brother. There's a little water. Huh? We got it going now. Sun's coming through the trees, little, little dew on the grass, right? Little reflection, right? I've done my psychedelics, I'm digging it. Little prismatic effect going on. I'm buzzing, man. I got goosebumps. I'm digging the front lawn, right? Guy drives by, sees man on lawn watering plants. Absolutely not what's going on. Man on front lawn catching serious buzz. That's what's going on, right? And that's life. I mean, you guys think, oh, you've you got nobody ever got high like you. <laughs> Please. <laughs> right? These this is a room full of dead people sitting up pretending they're paying attention to me. Right? Out there, the normies, they run up to the edge of the cliff and they go, oh, the cliff, and they jump back. This room is filled with the people that don't even stop, man. They just run and leap into the abyss, right? And we land in hospitals and prisons and mental institutions, graveyards, and here. This is really the only place you can find us where we're loose. <laughs> they shifted again. <laughs> So all I'm saying to you is come catch a buzz with us, man. Come marvel in the ordinary. Come find a design for living. It's way past not drinking and using. It's about going to having a good time. Take your turn. If all you heard today was wow, 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 right? Perfect. You stayed. You stayed here. You rode the whole damn thing out, right? That's your victory. Those little victories are real. They count. The idea for everybody in this room is don't go. Is to try to get to bed tonight without getting drunk or loaded. And if we do, we win. We win. doesn't matter. I don't care if the wheels fall off. If you're here be- feeling like you're ready to kill yourself or several other people at any moment, perfect. <laughs> we get it. We get it. Right? You're here and you're afraid and you're alone. You don't know how you're going to stay sober the rest of the day. Just say the, w- the hardest word to say for us. Help. Just say help. Just say help. We'll be there for you. Because we, we love you. We don't even know your name and we love you. Because we know what you had to do to come in here and sit in that seat. Right? We know. Nobody else knows. We know. We know. We love you for that. And, and we can move through this thing together. Together. So great events will come to pass for us and countless others like it's, ha- like it's happened in the past. Great events for us, addicts. So don't think you're in here just struggling to get on through, man. Come catch the buzz and be with the rest of us. Peace.